we have the high privilege of discussing the life and the times and the causes of a genuine hero, not just of the Israeli people, but I would say of the Jewish people writ large throughout the annals of our great and storied history. Before I welcome him to this program, I want to just read you his bio, and then we will discuss his military exploits, which are tremendous, and then we're actually going to dedicate the bulk of our time together to his incredible work looking after those who are most, most vulnerable in society and how he came to that. So let me first tell you about Major General Reserves Daron Almog. He was born in 1951. Almog held a number of command positions in the Israel Defense Forces, including leading a special force unit in Tripoli that targeted the terrorists who murdered Israeli athletes during the Munich Olympics. He was also the first of the elite commandos of the Israel Defense Forces to set foot on the runway in Entebbe, Uganda, as part of the storied raid on Entebbe in 1976, the operation that was launched to release predominantly Jewish hostages who were held for ransom in that airport, having been flown there in a hijacked Air France airliner. Doran Almog was responsible for clearing and marking the runway for the subsequent teams who later arrived in what is commonly considered one of the most daring operations in military history. He also participated in the clandestine airlift of 7,000 Ethiopian Jews to Israel, commanded the Paratroopers Brigade in the First Lebanon War, and most recently headed the IDF's Southern Command, a position he held until 2003. He earned an MA in International Relations from Haifa University and an MBA from Tel Aviv University. He's been awarded a number of prizes, including the Israel Prize for Lifetime Achievement, commonly thought of as the most prestigious prizes bestowed by the state upon its citizens. Even today, the Israel Defense Forces continues to seek his advice, strategic insight and recommendations on a regular basis. Daron's life, one of incredible service and heroism, is also one that's been greatly impacted by tragedy and adversity and personal hardship that called upon Daron once again to give the best of himself in the service of those unable to care for themselves and to challenge Israeli and indeed global society to understand that the strength and virtue of any society can most accurately be measured by how it treats its most vulnerable. His brother, Eran, of blessed memory, was killed in a tank battle during the 1973 Yom Kippur War. His daughter, Shoham, of blessed memory, was born with a severe injury to an artery in her heart and died a month after her birth in 1991. Five members of the Almog family from Haifa, those family aged 71, 70, 43, 11, and 9, were killed in the suicide bombing of Maxim Restaurant in Haifa on October 4th, 2003. Oron Almog, a family member of Doron's, aged just 10 at the time of that bombing, survived, but he was severely injured and blinded by that attack. Doron and his wife, Didi, gave birth to a son, Eran, named after the brother Doron lost so tragically. That son was born with severe disabilities. As Doron said in a future lecture, his son, Eran, who passed away in 2007, never once made eye contact with his father, never uttered the word Abba, father or dad, and never spoke, but he became the greatest teacher Doron ever knew, and he led Doron to found Ale, a society, community, facility, and I would say a vision that seeks to cater for those most in need of the assistance of others without imposing limitations upon anyone. Duran has often said that he views his work at Ale as a type of societal entebe, a mission that he undertakes daily to rescue those members of our society who are too often held hostage to circumstances beyond their control in need of the assistance that so many of us are able to give if only we would take the time to ask how and to answer the silent call for us to do so. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to invite you to listen to this conversation with Major General Doron Almog. General Almog, thank you so very much for being with us and welcome. Thank you, Benjamin, for this introduction. I'm ready. 
Thank you very much, sir. So I, I, I've uh, arranged that we're going to spend the first part of this talking about your military exploits, and then we're going to pivot to the vital work that you do for Israeli society and, and Brazil, and I also think for the world, quite frankly. So let's start with a little bit of background about you, because I've looked into some themes. I want to know who your parents were. How long has your family been living in Israel? Where did your parents arrive from? What was the ethos that they instilled within you and your and your siblings my parents both of them uh, mom and, and uh, my father born here in israel at the british mandate time uh, my father 1927 my mom 1929 they had one dream in their life one day to have a jewish state and uh, and for this mission they thought we need to be ready to give our life. We need to sacrifice ourselves because that's above everyone here. And the, the Jewish community at their time was below 600,000. Just to remind you, their independence war, 1947, from November 29, 47 to March 49, they lost about 6,000 from the Jewish community here, the small community, their first invasion after the last British soldier left on May 15, 1948, they faced invasion of seven Arab armies and they won. And I think this independence war shaped their life, but also my childhood and my values about our responsibility, my generation responsibility in the wake of, um, of our missions and um, how much and, and uh, what to do to protect the only Jewish state in the world. This is something, you know, it came through the stories of my childhood. Every Saturday, the friends arrived to our home, spoke about the fallen friends in, 48, spoke about the war, their war. I call the generation of my parents the silver plater generation. As you know, Alterman, one of the Israeli poets, greatest poets, a poet of 48, he wrote about uh, um, a boy and a girl who are moving and no one understands if they alive or dead. They have the battle equipment, they have uh, soil on their body, and they gave the independence and liberty to the state of Israel. So my parents is the silver plated generation. They gave me my values, they gave me the, I think, um, education, which above all, to love my country, to love my friends. Um, but as a matter of fact, and to be honest, they also ignore the disabled in our world. And uh, for my parents, I think that uh, the most powerful event was the independence war and, and then um, the loss of my brother in the Yom Kippur War. Yom Kippur War, uh, October 6, 1973, Saturday, all of a sudden, 2 p.m., the state of Israel was surprisingly attacked. Syrian in the north, the Egyptian in the south. We found ourselves in this war losing about 3,000 boys in the first three weeks. And among them was my brother. At that war, I was a company, part trooper company commander fighting in the south of Israel. Um, my brother, my second brother, Iran, was the uh, armor platoon commander at the 7th Brigade, 82nd Battalion, D Company, the commander of the 2nd Platoon. He was shot by Syrian tank, thrown outside, bleeding near his burn tank, and um, evacuated seven days later. The rumors in the Yom Kippur War said both of us were killed. My parents got the information about my brother on October 16, 1973. 
they didn't know about me. At the end of the war, I arrived to telephone call home. My mom raised the telephone. My first question was, what about Iran? She was surprised to hear my voice. She said, we lost Iran. We have no Iran anymore. I never seen my mom crying. She is now 91. Iron made. I saw my dad crying many times. Um, but in general, I can say that uh, the generation of my parents, the silver plated generation, is a generation who knew how to lose friends and never lose tear, uh, never cry. Um, and they continue supporting us to serve in military, in combat units. Me, my third brother, was 14 in the Yom Kippur War and later joined the Sayeret Matkal. And we found ourselves uh, continue fighting together. And you mentioned the Entebbe, the raid to Entebbe. So I want to tell you that uh, before getting the command on the reconnaissance unit of the Power Brigade, my brigade commander called me to his office and said, you are the best company commander I want to give you this reconnaissance unit that you need to be first in every mission. I don't know if I have the moral to give you this mission because you bereaved family. So he said, I don't know if I have the power to go to your parents if you are killed in action. I told him, okay, go now, speak with them. So he came to my parents' house. They told him, you trust the one? He said, yes. They told him, you can send him first to every mission behind the enemy line. You hear? If something happened, we know how to face it. We know to face bereavement. We lost many of our friends. We lost Iran, our second child. Do whatever is needed. You know, Isaac sacrificed it not only in the Bible, it's in my house, my parents' house. And, um, and I continue facing hundreds of battles during my military career. Um, as you mentioned, few of the operations. Uh, leading the paratroopers in the sex in the first Lebanese war, uh, 1982, from June 6 to June 13, fighting from the Awali River, landing in Awali River, and marching 17 kilo, 70 kilometers up to Beirut. We were the first to arrive to Beirut. The first four days, no supply, no water, no ammunition. The water came from the, the Lebanese village and the, the, the food from the terrorists that which were killed by our forces and some of the ammunition and the Kalachnikov from the terrorist headquarters and terrorist camps which uh, we defeated along the way. So I want to ask you about some of these incredible stories that you have. But before I do, I just want you briefly, you know, there's this phenomenon now, Doron, called the Zoom background. Everybody's living on Zoom and everybody's got a background and they have bookcases and awards and trophies. And I have the maps of the States of Israel, for example. But talking about your brother, in your background, you have some artifacts that are very important that, that's, yeah. that speak it's, it's, Yes, Test about it, please, if you would. This is, yeah, this is the, the ID tag of uh, my brother here and a song that Chaim Hefer is uh, also one of the greatest uh, poets that uh, the generation of my parents wrote for him, the young soldiers who were killed in battles. And he gave me with his signature uh, the ID tag here, there is picture also of my brother here, but uh, we see half of the picture, the, 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 uh, the lower part of the picture of my brother. But uh, the ID tag still covered with uh, his blood and the dry blood and the soil of the Golanites. And uh, is my brother that will continue bleeding within me until my last day. 
As a matter of fact, my brother is the oat, uh, nearest burn tank, the oat, which I did after finding his burn tank uh, to continue serving the state of Israel, to continue serving in combat unit, to continue fighting and never leave a wounded soldier behind. Just like that. That was my oath to my bleeding brother. And um, luckily I, I succeeded because I lost many of my friends on my right and left and behind me. Um, and uh, there were times that uh, Didi, my wife, uh, who came with me to every funeral, uh, said to me, I feel like swimming in an ocean of blood. Very painful. And, uh, and my brother was also the power. My bleeding brother was the power which I felt um, irrationally. I felt continue keeping me, continue watching me, like saying inside, do your best, my dear brother. Continue fighting for our country. You continue fighting for me as well. And you, and you have his ID tags, his dog tags hanging over your shoulder there in your office, and that memory moves you. And I wanted people to be aware of that, of just what, what infuses you and your ethos. And, Again, before we come to your work with Ale, which is going to be the primary focus of this conversation, there's a theme in your life that I look at, which is turning injustice into justice. And I want to deal with that militarily, first of all, with regard to the Munich uh, Olympics, the massacres that took place. You have Israeli athletes murdered at the hands of terrorists, and uh, you are charged with acting in the course of the operations to avenge those, those murders. Could you please tell me what exactly you thought um, when you got given the opportunity to do that? What was your thoughts as a young officer, as a young commander, when, when those atrocities took place? Um, the first uh, retaliation against the Munich massacre was uh, in February 1973, in Tripoli, far away from Israel. Um, it's uh, the, the, almost the junction between Lebanon and Syria, about 180 kilometers north to Rosh Hashanikra, the northern, the most northern place of Israel. The mission was uh, to raid on a terrorist base, move from room to room, and kill them. Um, all of them, killed them uh, from uh, close distance. Um, we, we had a cruise of about 48 hours at the sea, landing with, uh, with boats, marching about 10 kilometers, surprising them at their home, at their camp, fighting face to face. Um, I did most of the fighting as the first soldier, I found myself at the end, my force, altogether we killed 18. Uh, none of uh, my force, none of my soldiers wounded. I took two Kalachnikovs from uh, two terrorists that uh, battled me from one meter, just rush outside from uh, rooms. And, um, and then another force, uh, commanded by uh, Avner Hermoni, uh, arrived, join us, Avner wounded. So the, he was on a stretcher. Avner was the commander of the reconnaissance unit, the same unit that I commanded in Entebbe. So we had two forces uh, jointly operating on two objectives. So Avner himself wounded, we found ourselves uh, taking governor on, on a stretcher, climbing on a mountain, and um, calling to two Sikorsky 54 helicopters. The first landed, the first arrived um, with the pilot uh, later, Brigadier General Nehemia Dagan. He flew high above 
the refugee camp, Al Badawi camp. Uh, about 4,000 Kalachnikov shoot at the air. Some of the bullets get inside the helicopter. He landed to our trapeze um, almost like stone. We thought uh, that's going to be a disaster. But um, powerfully, uh, he landed, uh, slowed down, uh, and landed. And um, at first, we evacuated Davne Khormoni and his, his group, and, and then the second group, uh, the second helicopter a few minutes later, which was directed uh, by our force to come by low altitude to prevent shooting of the El Badawi refugee camp. On flight back, yeah. my, my brigade commander, while flying over Beirut, uh, brigade commander, uh, Colonel Uzi Airi, who was the commander of the mission, um, the highest commander on the ground of the mission, uh, asked me to come to the cockpit. I was on the back ramp. He asked me to come to the cockpit. I came and said, uh, I know you have two Kalachnikov, please. I want one of them present. I told him my privilege. I gave him this Kalachnikov. Um, later came the Yom Kippur War. He fought with this Kalachnikov. Later, 1973, 1974, 1974, few terrorists arrived from Lebanon, landed in Tel Aviv, took over Savoy Hotel, uh, took some hostages, and he arrived, Uzi Airi, with this Kalachnikov, with Sayeret Matkal, the same unit of uh, Yoni Netanyahu in Antebbe, and he was the only soldier, Colonel Uzi Airi, to be killed in this operation taking over the terrorists who took hostages at the heart of Tel Aviv, uh, near the sea. Uh, then, incredible, and the incredible stories you have. I, I want to ask you just three last questions about your military service and then, and then we'll move on. The, when you're given an order and the, the, the substance and the focus of that order is to go forward and to kill these terrorists who had murdered Israeli athletes, what exactly goes through your mind? Are you very clear of the virtue of the mission? Do you have any doubts as to whether or not the mission is, is one that you want to take on? What's your mindset as, as you receive it and as you carry it out, please, Doran? I'll I tell you honestly, it, it's happened to me many times, many times, to get mission to kill people behind the enemy line. And something in, during operation, sometimes it's happened that children came out, women came out, innocent people came out. And I want to tell you, honestly, I took many prisoners in, in uh, I brought to Israel, the suspected people that had no arms, weapon on, in, in their hands. And I taught, I educated my soldiers, you know, to be very sharp, very sharp as a soldier, and to shoot only those who are holding weapon in their hand. If there is danger to our forces, you do killing. Only those who are holding weapons. Only, you know, there is one condition. Mm -hmm. Beyond enemy line, there is no prime minister, there is no generals. You know, you are the leader. Yeah. You are in front. There is no, no place for hesitation. You need to decide on, on split second, nanoseconds. You need to decide who is enemy, who is not enemy. As a matter of fact, the moral of Antebe, this is the moral of Israeli soldiers. You got 105 Israeli hostages. You got seven terrorists inside. You need to penetrate from all sides the old terminal and shoot only, only the terrorists. Just to remind you, three of the hostages were killed from fire exchange, uh, unfortunately. Another one was killed by Idi Amin later in hospital, Dora Bloch, one of the hostages that, that was, was taken. But your message, your message to your soldiers is you kill only those with weapons in their hands. Yes. 
And it's not only weapon, but you know, you make decision at the enemy, behind enemy line. So it may be someone with explosive charge. If you feel danger, so you shoot. You shoot, sometimes you shoot to only to the legs. Sometimes you shoot to neutralize. It depends the situation. But you, you need very sharp, very quick, you need to make decision by your own. You are the chief of staff, you are the prime minister, there are no, no people, only your friends around you. You need to trust your friend, not to shoot at your friends or other forces. Friendly fire, what is sometimes happened. So you need to be highly trained, very focused, very focused, mm -hmm. very well trained for these missions. And when, when you get deployed, this is my, my last question about the military, when you get deployed over to, to Entebbe and you're involved in this most daring operation, you're not just involved in it, but you're actually responsible for leaping off the plane and then marking and charting a course, as I understand it, for other units to land and to land safely in order to rescue these hostages. What's going through your mind, Doron? What, what was the significance of the operation in Entebbe in terms of the psyche of the state of Israel entirely? Number one, it's about saving life. Number one, it's about 105 Israeli hostages kept by terrorists who are willing to kill them or to negotiate with the state of Israel to release 52 terrorists from Israel fly them to Germany in, in, in return. But our mission, first mission, to rescue the 105 Israeli hostages, to do our best to bring them back alive. This is number one. Number two, it's about uh, the pride. It's about, I, I don't know how much you were, but after the Yom Kippur War, the state of Israel was in shock, in trauma. We lost confidence. We lost trust. The public lost trust in, in leadership, Golda Meir government and the leadership and the high caliber leadership and the generals. And there, there was huge crisis inside the idea. So the Entebbe was a kind of rehabilitation for the state of Israel, a kind of pride, a kind of... Uh, um, we have the power and the spirit to do the impossible. And you know, no one believed that uh, we'll fly 4,000 kilometers, landing 11 p.m. sharp, kill the seven terrorists, and bring back the 105 Israeli hostages. We lost Yoni Netanyahu at the first part of the battle. Um, my mission, as a matter of fact, there, there were two parts of the Entebbe airfield. The new terminal, the new control tower, and the main runway far away from the all terminal and uh, all control tower. The hostages were at the military side, the old terminal and the old control tower. So the, the first Mercedes with my force and Yoni Netanyahu uh, unit came together. One Mercedes, two Land Rover Jeep, but after landing along the international lights, which at that time, 11, PM were on, mm -hmm. we landed without asking permission. But we estimated, we estimated that we'll shut down all the lights shortly after being aware that uh, some landing um, with no confirmation appeared. And that's what they did. So we landed and after 1,000 meters slow down at the speed of about 20 kilometers an hour, um, we jumped out, 10 soldiers with me. Four continue marking the runway and six together with me get inside, crossed um, the hill about uh, 400 meters from the runway was on the spot, on the hill was the new control tower. So, and, and the four soldiers who marked the runway after ending their mission joined me and we moved together from two sides. So there, there were two, there were four uh, Ugandan guards near the, the tower, near, near the control tower, and they shoot and kill them. And we got inside 
and um, clear the building from uh, bottom to top and then return uh, to evacuate uh, our force with the first Hercules, which uh, took off last. Um, seven minutes after our landing, number two landed, one minute later, one number three, one minute later, number four. Number four was the medical evacuation team. We got the permission to, got cl to get closer to the old terminal after Yoni Netanyahu unit finished killed, killing the terrorists and, and about uh, more 30 Ugandan guards. So altogether, well, we killed about 40 uh, Ugandan and terrorists together. And, and by the second and third Hercules, we brought also APCs, armor personnel carrier, BTR-40, they were Russian armor card because of the way they, uh, uh, this BTR, the, the weight of uh, this BTR was only five ton. Mm -hmm. um, on the opposite to the M113, which weigh about 10 ton. So we need, that, we need more fuel and, and less weight inside. So we took the BTR-40 for this mission to um, reinforce or to block any reinforcement which supposed to be made by Ugandan troops. So and they, uh, the, the four BTR-40, commanded by Shaul Mofaz, later Minister of Defense, and Omer Balev, later commander of Sayyid Matkal, they blocked the main way, the main, main access to Entebbe, and also destroyed the MiG, the MiG-21 jets that were on the ground. Also, uh, they started shooting at the old control tower against the soldiers who shoot toward the only Netanyahu and, and the first group. So, 52 minutes on the ground and then it was over. As a matter of fact, the first few minutes, uh, it was all over by the troops that arrived with the first Hercules. Number one to take off was the number four to land, the medical evacuation team. Number three, second, and uh, number two, three, and number one, taking off, leaving Entebbe airfield last. Uh, we landed, uh, we had no enough gasoline to fly directly to Israel. We also, uh, some of my soldiers, the, my reconnaissance unit uh, soldiers were responsible to refuel near the new uh, uh, terminal, but uh, the pumping moved too slow. Mm. So we decided to go to plan B. Plan B was moving, flying to Kenya, Landing in Nairobi and refueling, Eud Barak was responsible to it, uh, to uh, organize this mission, negotiate with the Kenyan. So we refueled and flew back to Israel. Um, the number four Hercules with the hostages and uh, the backup force of Sayeret Golani landed in Ben Gurion Airport, the military side of Ben Gurion. We landed in Tel Nof. The other three airplanes, welcomed by uh, Minister of Defense, Shimon Peres, and other high-ranking officers. Um, and my, my first conversation was uh, with my parents, because they knew. They knew that uh, we are flying to Entebbe. Yeah, you, are, you are look astonished, but uh, um, July 1st, Thursday, July Thursday, July 1st, 1976, I arrived home to my parents' home uh, from Golanites, from training at the Golanites. The, the, the moment I opened the door, my mom said, uh, my dear son, I know you're going to fly to Entebbe. I don't know what they're speaking. She said, uh, you see, you see the, all this, uh, you see a list of these people, all these people were calling and looking after you from uh, the general headquarters. So sit down, answer them, I know, my, your mom, I know that you're going to fly to Entebbe. And uh, 
when we landed, my first telephone was home. Now I want to tell you that uh, the Israeli radio published on our way back. It was 3 a.m. July 4. By the way, the 200th anniversary of the United States, 1976, July 4. Mm-hmm. While flying back to Israel, 3 a.m., the Israeli radio said there was a successful operation in Entebbe, all our forces. Now, flying back home, one of the high-ranking officers wounded. So my parents, you know, were sitting, waiting, waiting. Then the first telephone called to my parents' house. Uh, and the first question of my mom, who is the guy? Yeah. I said, Yoni, my friend, Yoni, is not anymore with us. Yoni Netanyahu. Yoni Netanyahu, brother of our Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. No, that, that's the Antebbe, but, uh, you know... Aron, it's, it's incredible what you've done. And obviously, anyone could talk to you for, for hours and days about, about your exploits as a commander. But there's something else that I, I want to dedicate the rest of our time to. And, and that is the tremendous impact upon you that the birth of your son, Iran, had named after your brother, killed in the Yom Kippur War, he was born with severe learning difficulties, and, and it seems to me, severe difficulties altogether, and it seems to me and to Rosita as we've talked to you, that somehow you're faced with this and you manage to harness all of your strength, all of your resilience, all of your commitment to a cause greater than any one individual, and, and you decide that this tremendously difficult circumstance is something that's going to cause you to rise again and, and to deploy your talents and your abilities, not in service of the physical security of the state of Israel, but in the service of the societal security and well-being of the state of Israel. Because they said in the introduction, you believe a society is only ever as good and as strong as the care it gives to those most in need and most vulnerable. Tell us, please, about your life story. It's almost a second revolution of your life, if you like, that came about via the birth of your son, Iran. Our son, Iran, born January 6, 1984. Just in, uh, it's a period of um, many missions in Sudan to bring Jews from Ethiopia. Clandestine operation in Sudan. Each operation, the Prime Minister of Israel was waiting for us together with uh, Mossad. Um, we gave him the name of my brother that was killed in the Yom Kippur War. And as Every parent in the world, we expected him to be better than us, a source of pride, more talented, more successful. Be one day, be something for the pride of the family, for the continuation of the family. At the age of eight months, he was diagnosed, and we were told by a psychologist, your son is having a combination of autism, and retardation, that the specific word she used. She said, I believe he will never speak. She said, I believe he will permanently stay at the age of three or four months. Yeah, something like that. There are moments in your life you feel the sky dropping down, crashed on your head. That, that was a moment like that. My wife, Didi, started crying. And then you ask yourself, how continue managing our life if our son has no future at all? He won't be graduated by kindergarten. I think after about two years, we saw smile, just smile on his face. Like asking us from his shouting silence, you know, never gaze, never look at your eyes. You always his gaze stuck at the corner, somewhere aside. Never say a word. So this smile was like saying, my dear parents, are you ready to give up the, the dream, the expectation of one day your son is something, a Nobel Prize winner, whatever, engineer, lawyer, pilot, fighter, no, my dear parents, I won't be, I won't arrive to any achievement of your dream. Nothing. 
my dear parents. But are you ready to continue being my parents only for one thing, only to make me happy, only to bring smile to my face? We said, yes, Didi, my wife and me, we are ready. I'm saying that he was the greatest teacher of my life, the greatest professor, because we moved all over Israel to see our children like him are kept. We saw shameful institute, shameful centers, stinky, horrible places, no pride of the workers. You know, you look at the workers, ask them, what is this place? There's no sign outside, there's no title. They lower their, their eyes down. They don't look at you. They're fully ashamed. And then we started hearing about parents who moved their children overseas. Like Igal Alon was the first Israeli commander of the Southern Command in 48. In our way, he was a legend, a legendary fighter, a strategist, a fighter, uh, wrote many books. He was um, a strategist thinker, my parents admired him. Uh, the daughter, Nurit, born in Kibbutz Genosar, north of Israel, at the age five, she's described in a book, in a bio about Igal Alon, as beautiful child. At the age five, the parents decided no place for Nurit in our family, neither in the Kibbutz nor in the state of Israel. She was taken to Scotland. He has never said one word about her, never mentioned. Her brother, Iftar served in, in the same unit, in the same power unit that I did, that I served. He didn't know. That was a secret. You know, we moved all, all along our country and, and we heard more and more stories of shameful parents who are hiding their children. Some overseas, some in Israel, never speak about them. So the children, like our son, were enveloped by heavy walls of shame, stigma, stereotype. And, um, and we understood, Didi, my wife and me, we understood that um, we need to, to do a change in Israel society. This child, these children are bounded by special education law. The special education law say the state of Israel recognized these children at the age three. The word diagnosis doesn't appear in the law. What does it mean? He was diagnosed at the age of eight months. It means, wait, you want psychologist by your own. You want medication by your own. Everything by your own. So, so it, it, like our son saying, whoa, my dear father, you say, I love your friend that love yourself. We're all responsible one for each other, but you, are, you don't want to take responsibility on children like me. You're fully ashamed on, on the presence of, of children like me. You take me overseas. You hide me. And then at the age 21, we got a formal letter from Israeli Minister of Education, Dear Didi and Duron, your son reached 21. He won't continue studying any longer in special education school. That's it. It was difficult to raise him. Now you are by your own. So I was the commander of the Israeli Southern Command, Major General, and I decided to change Israel society. Number one, to build a village, full lifespan, full lifespan, because we did him, my wife and me, we were worried. What will happen to him after we pass away? I thought we pass away before him. So we wanted to guarantee his future. We planned some paradise for him, a village which uh, the planning cost was about um, $50 million at first. People told me, you are crazy. At that time I, I was fighting in Gaza, losing many soldiers in battle. Uh, I lost 86 people in, in Gaza, 50, 58 soldiers um, and, and civilians in Gaza Strip. Um, and people told me, you're crazy. You need to stay in military. You need to be a chief of staff. And I said, that's it. I'm going 
right now I'm going to build a village for my son. Um, luckily, we created uh, a joint venture with the government, headed at that time by Ariel Sharon, the Prime Minister. So the Prime Minister and the government agreed to joint venture, which means from one side, non-profit organization, Ale Negev, from the other side, the State of Israel, 50-50. So the first interministerial governmental decision was about 100 million shekel, mm -hmm. which at that time was about $25 million. Yeah. So uh, uh, the, the government recognized the need to build a, a full lifespan solution for disabled children like our son and so on. Um, the government ready to invest 100 million shekel in one condition that the non-profit organization, Ale Negev, will bring 50% of the sum, which is needed to build the project. So I said, okay, that is, you know, uh, June 16, 2002, just at the middle of my period as the commander of the Israeli Southern Command, the Israeli government approved the project with this sum, 100 million shekel. So, I came to Ministry of Defense and said, um, okay, this is my mission to bring 50% of the money. I need to live. I need to give a solution to my son. He said, no, Shaul Mofad at that time, who was the Minister of Defense, said, no, 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 stay, stay longer. You have good chance to be Chief of Staff. I said, that's it, finish. So I continue one more year, 2003, July 2003, I left office um, parallel to my mission as the commander of the Southern Command. We did planning from 2001 to 2003. 2003, we invited the Prime Minister Ariel Sharon to come for a groundbreaking ceremony in a tent, throwing stone to a bird. And um, a year later, 2004, we started building. 2006, January 2006, we opened. Alenege village. We brought our son. Unfortunately, a year later, February 7, 2007, he passed away from very rare disease, Castleman disease, which is like, like the COVID-19, destroying lungs. Was treated with, with the chemotherapy and radiation, things like that, which uh, destroyed his immunity system. That was awful period. However, we build a village which is paradise for him and paradise for children like him. Right now we have in this village 160 children like him, full lifespan until they pass away. But also we decided to break down the walls of shame and stigma. How come? Number one, serving all the one million people who are living in south of Israel serving by rehabilitation. Rehabilitation, about 20% of, uh, of people suffer somehow one day, some days from some injury, sport injury, road accident, home accident, walk accident. So that, that facility, Alen Negev, is something that you've opened up to the broader population, about one million in southern Israel, who if they need yeah. rehabilitation can go there and gain that rehabilitation, is that correct? Yes, but why? Because, you know, we found in Israel isolated centers, which no one wanted to come and see them. No one wanted to visit the children. Right. They were isolated. Right, you were they isolated, were you were kept out, of sight, kept out of sight, out of mind, and you say we can actually contribute through this center and bring people to understand what's going I, on. I, what I said exactly, this is, that will be not institute, that will be social community center, integrating all the people of Israel. We have Bedouins and Muslims. Okay, we have Bedouin and Muslims also in al village. Mm -hmm. We give rehabilitation services through the Israeli HMOs, Kupot Cholim. Yep. We have four HMOs. We have the Ministry of Defense to cover um, soldiers injury. So we treat soldiers, we, we treat people who are living in the south of Israel, 
They may be students, they may be workers, they, they may be high tech members, they may be a parliament member, it doesn't matter. Right, Something right. happened, you are treated in Alenege. Physiotherapy, hydrotherapy, music therapy, communication therapy, psychologist advice, and, and, and more. So we do the rehabilitation in Alenege together. At the same swimming pool, the same hydrotherapy center, you may find a Bedouin, you may find a, a Christian, um, from that, our that model, that, that model, which is just an incredible model, has that model been replicated anywhere else in the world of turning something dedicated to those with severe disabilities as, as, as a remedy for those who, who are just seeking rehabilitation from adversity in their day-to-day lives? Have you seen that replicated anywhere, Doron? Not yet, but uh, hopefully people will come, uh, people from all over the world arriving to study the model and uh, and people thinking this is a great model, but you know the performance is very difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, Professor Joe Krakover from Johns Hopkins University in the United States came to visit us three years ago. He said, "This is an amazing place. This is the first rehabilitation, the top rehabilitation service I ever seen." He said, "You need to be pioneering on rehabilitation. Do a research." Right now, we build a new rehabilitation hospital for 108 people. We build a research center. We do a new model, which named Translational Rehabilitation Research, which means a connection between academy and the field on the ground. We are the clinical field on the ground. Mm-hmm. You, know, you know, I don't know how much you will, but there, there is a gap of about 40 years between the knowledge at the academy and lab and the people, the wounded people on the ground, the disabled people on the ground. And we we need to shorten this gap. The gap. Mm -hmm. How come by this translational rehabilitation research? So we build, right now, we build uh, a neighborhood for for students, students from Ben-Gurion University who will live close to our hospital, walk and do their practice of the re- rehabilitation profession in Alenegev, treating wounded people. So we build uh, a neighborhood for students, for volunteers, for workers. By the way, we have right now, we have more than 800 workers, uh, uh, more than 800 volunteers. Right now we have 500 workers and 800 volunteers. Volunteers from 12 different countries, from United States and Canada and Australia and Germany, and Holland and uh, uh, Guatemala and, and more countries. Uh, I've got this incredible, incredible thing that you told us about, which is that the grandchildren or the descendants of Nazis have actually yeah. arrived at your center. Can you tell us a bit about that? They've done that deliberately. T- tell us about what's occurred. Yeah, well, we, we have, we have uh, Christian from Germany who are arriving to Alenege for atonement. You know, they do testimony, they do video testimony, they put it on Facebook. Um, and like one of them, Timo, is, he's saying, he's stating, I born to, um, to parents who were raised by my grandparents, were Nazis, served in the Nazi party, killed Jews in Auschwitz and Treblinka and Dachau, Second World War. And I come to Alenegg for atonement. Atonement on the murder of six million Jews and atonement on Hitler's decision to kill the disabled first. The cognitive disabled first. I don't know if you know the T4 Actia. T4 Actia is an order issued by Hitler himself, signed by Hitler on September 1st, 1939. The first day of Second World War, Hitler by himself issued the T4 Actia saying to, saying to shift the psychiatric center all over Germany to a small concentration camp, gather the disabled, like our son, and kill them by small gas chambers. So the documents are all uh, kept um, and uh, and they are coming and say, we come for atonement. So it, it, it's, it's very moving. You know, the, the, we have uh, all the time, we have uh, 
a Christian from Germany, mainly from Berlin, with the same testimony, repeating again and again and again, we come for atonement. Young, you know, physically very beautiful, and they say no more racist ideology. We all human beings, we all equal. Some, we all equal by our rights, but not equal by our power. So our mission in, 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 in this world to serve the disabled, to serve those who were highly discriminated by um, migrant parents, and to make okay. tikkun olam. So Ron, can I ask you the society. two last questions with the time that you've given us? Do you mind? Can I ask yeah. you two more questions? The first question I want to ask you, because I, I wonder, have you secured Ale financially for its lifespan? And, and if, if not, if it's an ongoing mission to raise funds, can you tell us about how people, even during these difficult times, might be able to contribute to a cause such as the one that you founded? Uh, we have a website, so uh, it, can be, uh, it can be done uh, digitally by the internet by www.ale.org. Ale, a L E H dot O R G. We have um, branches all over the world. In, in the United States, we have the JNF, the Jewish National Fund, mm -hmm. which is a uh, partner with us. And uh, the Jewish National Fund all over the United States ever um, having um, uh, representative uh, of uh, the JNF, and, and they know very well Alain Negev, which is uh, which is the the the, uh, the flag of uh, the the JNF here in uh, in Israel. Uh, before the coronavirus, every week they send tourists, a bus of tourists every week, sometimes every day, of about between twenty to fifty people arriving from United States donors. People continue donating even now at the coronavirus period, even at this difficult time, digitally, by the internet, uh, raising telephone, people understand that uh, the test of uh, the social chain is always measured by its weakest link. People understand the, uh, the fragility and temporary nature of, of our human being, even or, or maybe better at this coronavirus when all of a sudden everything is changed. Mm -hmm. And even in this economic crisis, world economic crisis, people continue donating. And people understand uh, that we are not here forever, but we need uh, to leave our children a legacy of goodness a legacy which will keep our memory, maybe forever. Because, you know, when we said as Jews, we're all responsible, one for each other. And, you know, this is the glue. This is the spirit of the Jewish people right. all over the, the 2,000 years in, in diaspora. That was the spirit. Like, like in a special unit, we say one for all, all for one. It's the same. It's the same spirit. So this mutual responsibility. Uh, and we say, when, when is it tested? It tested in crisis time. When you lose someone, when you mourn on someone, when you are in crisis. So let, me, let me ask you a question about this then, and, and this will be my last question to you. This is a time when people find themselves living through adversity and uncertainty and Several people, many people have lost loved ones to the, to the virus and people financially are insecure and unsure what their future might be. And there's a real, a real foreboding and wonder about, wondering about what might await them. And you sit here, you've got the ID tag of your brother still soaked with his blood hanging behind you. You've, you've lost your son. You lost a daughter. Various members of your family were killed in the 
in the suicide bombing of the Maxim restaurant. I mean, you are a man who has seen tremendous adversity and yet you've always risen and you've always come back and you're still in the midst of, of fighting a fight that's for a purpose greater than yourself. What would be your message of hope and of strength to, to anybody listening during these uncertain times? Why should nobody ever despair? I think that the message is uh, try to be focused on one thing in every situation to create a hope, a hope for ourselves, for our destiny, for our honor, for our family, that to give meaning for every action we do in, in this world. We need um, to respect the time, which is need to be very much treasured. We are temporary here and we need to be to exploit every every minute for meaningful life. That's um, you know from my 69 years, looking back in retrospect and looking forward, always to be focused on on goodness, on creating hope. It does matter how deep the crisis. It does matter how much tragedy and blood we pay in our life to continue staying strong and give hope to our society. That, that, this is my message. Well, Doron, we're, we're so very grateful. I, I want to reiterate my thanks to, to my colleague, Rosita, who was responsible for putting us together, and also to Alan for bringing this about, uh, our, my great and powerful colleague and international coordinator. Thank you to you for everything that you've done, and of course, your dear wife, who I'm sure is engaged in all of this alongside you. And I've often said it, but I really do believe that our generation of Jews and even Israelis, we're mere dwarfs that sit astride the shoulders of giants like you. You really are a giant in the annals of Jewish history and the Jewish present and future. Thank you for everything. I hope you go from strength to strength. And I hope that some of the people here will consider investing in your vital cause because it's ultimately to the good of society writ large. And I hope you'll come back and maybe... We'll have the pleasure of hosting you in America once the world comes back to rights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, sir. you. Thank you, Benjamin. And uh, you are all invited. Uh, when you come to Israel, please come and visit. Make a, a contact with me. We welcome you every minute. We will send those details around. Thank you. And stay in touch. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.